What's going on, everybody? It's your boy, Broadway Joel, the voice of Dominican boxing. And today we have a very special show. I feel like I say that I've been saying that a lot lately. Uh, part of that is I may I am giving you guys content you cannot get somewhere else. So, you know, definitely excited about today's show. I will be interviewing the legendary, probably the greatest of all time in terms of, uh, you know, boxing play-by-play, play, Jim Lampley. Uh, he was the voice at HBO for uh, three decades. Uh, he was the voice of many, many fights. You know, most of, you know, uh, Mayweather's big fights, most of De La Hoya's big fights. And, you know, he did, uh, you know, uh, Don, uh, you know Chavez fights and Mike Tyson fights, Lennox Lewis, like Pacquiao, Barrera, Morales. Marquez, you, you name it, you name the name. And if he's a oh, he's actually calling me right now. So guys, give me one sec.
Uh, I'm sorry, guys. He's having trouble with the app. I mean, with the link. Uh, he's having trouble with the technology. So please bear with me.
All right. We got Jim Lampley here. Uh, I did it. Yes, you did. Uh, I, I appreciate your uh, persistence. Uh, that was very, uh, you know. Well, it made I've had like an idiot, have... but we but we managed to get it done. So um, very gratifying over the long haul. Yeah, I, I appreciate your patience and, and determination to get to in, interview. I'm very. I, I can't explain to you how excited I am to do this interview. Uh, I grew up a boxing fan. I grew up on HBO. So like for for the longest time, you were the voice of the biggest fights because HBO was always known for having the biggest fights. So you were the voice for that. And for me to have you on the show, it's 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 very uh, I feel very accomplished because uh, I, I, you're a legend in my book. Well, pleasure to be here and uh, nice to make your acquaintance. All right. So, uh, but before I get into your career and and uh, uh, and everything and and what are you doing currently, I kind of want to get into the story of Jim Lampley. So, um, from what I understand, you grew up in Henderson, North Carolina, correct? Nope, Hendersonville. Nope. Hendersonville. Very, excuse me. Make that distinction. Henderson is a uh, tobacco town in the uh, northern part of North Carolina. If you have ever heard of a famous broadcaster named Charlie Rose, he grew up in Henderson. Uh, Hendersonville is a uh, resort town in the mountains just south of Asheville, uh, North Carolina. I grew up in Hendersonville, uh, and uh, uh, I was introduced to boxing. My father died when I was five years old, uh, and when I was six, less than a year later, my mother was going to a holiday party at a friend's house near our home. And she took me uh, to this party for adults and marched me down a hallway and sat me down uh, on a sofa in front of a small television set that was on a TV dinner tray. Uh, and she said, sit right here. Uh, you're going to be watching Gillette Friday Night Fights. The fight is Sugar Ray Robinson versus Bobo Olson. Uh, it's their second fight. It's for the middleweight championship of the world. And the reason you're doing this is because if your father were still alive and if he were here, this is exactly what you would be doing. Um, and so that's how my uh, exposure to boxing began. And for the next several years, I became a very big fan of uh, Gillette Friday Night Fights. Um, and uh, my mother, before she left the room that first day, uh, talking about uh, Sugar Ray Robinson and Bob Olson, said, uh, in the next hour and a half, you're going to learn everything you need to know about boxing from Don Dunphy. So decades later, when I began calling fights at ABC Sports, and I was, you know, on an extended basis, not the immediate successor to Howard Cosell, but the next guy after two or three other people had uh, tried that chair and I became the next person to try that chair. And, and um, by sticking in, in that role and enduring it, I became Cosell's successor at ABC. And a lot of people would ask me, you know, is, is he your model? Is he the voice that you hear in your head when you're calling fights? And I would always say, no, Don Dunphy. Uh, and, and that's because I heard Dunphy called many fights before I ever heard uh, anyone, anyone else call uh, a fight. And, um, and I, you know, got into television broadcasting when I was 25 years old as the result of a talent hunt for a particular role at ABC Sports. The last thing that anyone would ever have suspected at that time was that I would wind up calling boxing because at boxing or at, at, ABC Sports, I should say. Boxing meant Cosell. It didn't mean anybody but Cosell. And I was pretty sure that if I even uttered the word in the building, uh, I could possibly get decapitated because he was very jealous of his turf and, uh, and aggressively negative to anybody who might interfere with his turf. i had already had one horrible experience uh, as his successor on the halftime highlights for Monday Night Football. And I wasn't looking for another one. But in 1987, um, 12 years, 13 years into my career at ABC, the company had been sold. Uh, new management had come into the sports division. 
And the person who had been installed as the head of the sports division was infuriated by my lucrative contract and status. And he thought of me as a worthless kid and wanted to get rid of me. Uh, I, I, uh, and he thought that we'll, the best way to get rid of me would be to assign me to boxing. I, I, and we'll, we'll get more into that. I, I kind of want to go a little bit uh, uh, chronologically. So, uh, piece by piece. Yes, yes. Uh, so you, you uh, did when you how how quick of a fan did you uh, how quick of a boxing fan did you become at the age of six after watching that Sugar Ray Robinson fight? Were you an instant boxing fan after that, or was it a gradual thing? Like, uh, I, how was your experience uh, into becoming a boxing fan? Well, my mother was a big Robinson fan. And, oh, and really? she told me before that fight, she said, you're going to be watching watching the best fighter in the world. And, uh, and on that basis, you know, I recognized quality when I saw it. Um, he had trouble with Olsen. It was a tough matchup for him. But, uh, but I could see what my mother was talking about in terms of grace and skill and footwork and all that stuff. I was already a sports fan watching football and other things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I pretty instantly became a Robinson fan and I, um, got, uh, very interested in a lot of other fighters who were appearing on Gillette Friday night fights. Um, and most especially, uh, Emil Griffith, who was a frequent, uh, headline attraction on Friday night fights in 1961. I watched Griffith Perrette. Uh, and learned one of the hardest truths about boxing. In 1960, I watched the Rome Olympics uh, on television and saw a middleweight uh, Olympic gold medalist named Cassius Clay and fell in love with him for a variety of different reasons. So, um, so it was a constant ongoing learning process and uh, I remained a boxing fan through all the years uh, that I was watching it on television, even the years when I was working at ABC and never, ever expected to get in front of a microphone and call a fight. Okay. Uh, and uh, so so I know later, uh, as you mentioned, you, you, you covered all sports. Was boxing always your favorite sport? Or Well, I wouldn't say it was my favorite sport. It, it was... It was one of the many sports that I treasured. Uh, that, that experience in 1955, when my mother sat me down to watch uh, Robinson and Olsen, that's the first sports event that I can specifically remember watching. I know I had probably seen snippets of uh, some other ones, but you know there was, there was the whole uh, articulated reality of her saying, your father would do this if he was here. You're going to watch this. These are the reasons you should be interested, et cetera. Uh, and, uh, and Cassius Clay uh, became my favorite athlete uh, for a variety of reasons, uh, among them being that he was using a slave name to taunt the white establishment on behalf of uh, the cause of civil rights and equality. And I was deeply attracted uh, to that. But there are other markers in there. In 1957, um, I remember very specifically uh, a party my mother had at our house where uh, we watched on television uh, and listened on radio at the same time to the NCAA basketball championship game, which was the University of North Carolina versus Kansas in Kansas City. Uh, and that night, the University of North Carolina Tar Heels beat Kansas to win the national championship, beating Wilt Chamberlain and completing a 32-0 and season. It's very rare, as you know, for uh, an NCAA basketball champion to finish the season unbeaten. I watched that. It was 1957. I was just about eight years old, maybe a few days short of eight years old. It was the first time I was allowed to stay up past midnight. It was the first time I ever tasted uh, a small sip of Budweiser beer. Uh, so did, that, did you sneak it or, or was it given to you? It was given to me. Uh, <laughs> oh, there was a lot oh, of oh. celebrating going on. And one of my, one of my uncles said here, you know, 
uh, if your dad were here, this is what he'd be doing, but the same kind of thing. Uh, and, uh, and so, you know, I became a huge fan of college basketball and okay. stayed up late at night many times listening to uh, University of North Carolina on the radio. And then when I was uh, 12 years old, my mother moved us to Miami. And uh, so I moved to Miami in 1961. And I was still very, very much a boxing fan. I remember watching Griffith Perret specifically uh, in the den of our rented house uh, in Miami. And I was reading the sports pages of the Miami Herald and the Miami News. I was, I was picking winners in the horse races at Tropical Park near my house. Uh, and, uh, and growing as a sports fan all the time. And somewhere along that way, I, I read in the newspaper in Miami that um, Cassius Clay was moving toward fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world. And that if he happened to fight Sonny Liston for the title, it was logical and likely that that fight would take place at the Miami Beach Convention Center. And I learned that uh, Angela Dundee was training Cassius Clay at a place called the Fifth Street Gym on Miami Beach. And I two or three times encouraged my mother and convinced my mother to drive us the 30 miles from our crappy tracked house home in Southwest Miami to Miami Beach to the Fifth Street Gym to try to watch Angelo Dundee training um, Cassius Clay. He was still Cassius Clay at the time. And uh, in those trips, I never actually saw him train Cassius Clay. We didn't time it right. I watched him train a Cuban welterweight named Luis Rodriguez. I watched him train a uh, middleweight champion named Willie Pastrano. Never got a chance to see him train Clay. But when the Liston Clay fight was made, I saved lawn mowing and car washing money for months to buy a ticket to go to that fight, uh, which in my memory cost $100. It might have cost $150. I did not save the ticket. That was stupid. Mm -hmm. um, but I did go to the fight. My mother dropped me off outside the Miami Beach Convention Center. I went in with my one ticket. Uh, I watched the fight alone. My hero beat Liston uh, in the biggest upset in heavyweight history to that time. We came back home and I got up on the roof of my house screaming, I've upset the world. I'm the greatest of all time, et cetera, et cetera. And so my mother came out and said, get down off the roof. You're going to get us both arrested. Um, so, you know, those are my memories on the road to becoming a, um, a big boxing fan. And uh, again, a lot of it had to do with what Cassius Clay eventually Muhammad Ali represented. He taught me a lot of lessons. Um, I was, I was devastated. I was really disturbed when I read three days after the Liston fight that he had changed his name. Um, but I learned from that. I, I learned that uh, his identity as a man and as a fighter was his and not mine. Uh, and no matter how much I loved him and revered him, I didn't own him. That was an important lesson. Uh, as a teenager, he taught me my position on the Vietnam War. I, uh, my father had been a military hero in World War II. I couldn't have conceived the idea of being against a war. But from Ali, I learned enough about Vietnam and particularly, um, you know, you, you know, the great line, no Viet Cong ever called me the N word. Uh, and uh, and so he taught me that. And uh, and I can honestly say, I think he taught me a lot of things uh, as we went along uh, on route to uh, on route to finally meeting as human beings once I was calling fights on HBO. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to stay on the Muhammad Ali topic. Uh, I heard a story that uh, there was one time uh, you had something to do. And I believe it was in New York and you were with your daughter and you had nobody to stay with her. And Muhammad Ali told you, go do what you got to do. And he stood with your daughter for a, a, a few hours until you went and did what you had to do and come back. Uh, well, you're very well schooled. Uh, and yes, I'm, I'm glad you know that story. Hold on just a second. No problem.
Ah, yes. Oh, oh, just a little bit more to All your right, no, 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 the other one. That was... There we go. Um, there. Maybe. Uh, where in the hell? You, is you don't have to wrong? tilt it. Don't tilt it. You never there figure it out. But there you go. Uh, yeah, that's that... obviously Muhammad on the right. That's me in the center, and that is my daughter Brooke uh, on the left. And that photo was taken uh, on that night in 1988. When he babysat her for, there you go, I'm tilting it forward, get a much better look. Yeah. Yes. When he babysat her uh, for, yeah, a couple, couple or a few hours, I want to say three hours while I went out and ran errands on an extremely busy day in the streets of Manhattan. And I, um, you know, I, when I was riding home with her in the cab at the end of the evening, back to her mother's house on uh, the Upper East Side, she asked me, um, she was, she was eight at that moment. And she asked me, she said, dad, who was that man? And I said, well, um, that's a long story. And as you grow older, you will certainly learn it. You'll read about him. You'll, you'll know everything eventually. Uh, but, uh, for tonight, I'll send you to bed with just one observation, which is, um, he is unquestionably, indisputably the most famous man in the world. And uh, she was properly impressed by that. Uh, and I think that that experience, along with a lot of others, helped to give my daughter her um, very powerful and unique sense of self. And uh, she's now global chairman of fine art sales for Sotheby's Auction House. Uh, and I used to say of Brooke, Brooke Lampley that she uh, is the most uh influential art executive her age in the world and nowadays um i don't use the words her age she's the most influential art sales executive in the world and certainly experiences like that one with muhammad probably primarily that one with muhammad but going to olympics with me in sarajevo and barcelona and atlanta and uh, Beijing and meeting um, gold medal winners and uh, famous stars, et cetera, et cetera, uh, in those experiences also helped her to recognize that, you know, she um, was capable of touching greatness and she was capable of being great. And uh, I think at the end of the day, when all is said and done, uh, we'll probably say that Brooke was even greater at what she did than her famous father. Interesting. Uh, uh, so, so, uh, considering Ali was your childhood hero, was somebody you had a personal relationship and, you know, and, you know, had met plenty of times and ha you gave you that experience with your daughter. Uh, when you got the news that he was no longer with us, how much did that affect you and how much did that affect your daughter, Brooke? Um, you know, I'm not ashamed to be a person who sheds tears. Uh, I, I shed tears pretty freely and easily. My mother always said to me that that's a sign of strength, not of weakness. So I shed tears when I heard about Ali. My daughter shed tears when I told her about it on the phone. I still shed tears to think of um, the suffering he experienced and the nobility he showed uh, through all the years uh, as he moved step by step toward that uh, inevitable result. Um, I believe we got the word that he had died. It was the night before uh, the third fight between Orlando Salido and the, the opponent with whom he had uh, terrific brawls. I don't remember exactly right now. Uh, it will come to me at some point. But we were doing a fight uh, in uh, either the Forum or uh, StubHub in Carson, California, and uh, got the word the night before the fight. And I, you know, I realized I was going to have to do um, something I'd done several times and would do again, which is uh, that you know, ringside moment when I stand on camera and do 
uh, a eulogy for somebody. And uh, that was one of the most difficult of those. Okay. All right. Well, uh, I, I, I want to circle back to uh, you when you went to college. You went to UNC and uh, studied English. Uh, what, did you go into college wanting to be a broadcaster? Did you know that that's what you wanted to do, cover sports? No. Uh, I had, had zero idea uh, of what I wanted to do. And I never would have dreamed that I could uh, articulate a career uh, directly by, you know, doing what I did at college. I just wanted to try to uh, succeed in getting an education and honor my mother for everything she had been able to do to um, keep us together and, uh, and going forward through all the years after my father died. So um, I, uh, I eventually chose English literature because I like to read books. Uh, and I was far better at that than anything science or math related. And uh, eventually, um, I uh, immediately after graduating from undergraduate school at UNC, I was asked to volunteer in a United States Senate campaign for a, a candidate I respected, a United States congressman from here uh, who shared my views about a lot of things. And I went to work in that political campaign. And then um, the work I did there as a volunteer got me a paying job with a professional theater company and um, as the publicist. And eventually I figured out that um, I should go to graduate school in mass communications to try to set myself up uh, for the best chance at making an income in the future. And while I was in graduate school, uh, in mass communications here at UNC uh, in a department called Radio, Television, and Motion Pictures, ABC Sports, it was 1974, ABC Sports um, had developed an idea for putting a college age or close to college age person on the sidelines of the college football telecast. And uh, if you were a, a sports fan of even your age, uh, it, it, you might think that there's always been a reporter on the sidelines of football games. I mean, it's mm -hmm. such a stock item now, everybody kind of takes it for granted. But when I went on to the sidelines of Tennessee versus UCLA in 1974 in Knoxville, Tennessee, September 7, 1974, no one had ever stood on the sidelines of uh, a football game with a camera and a microphone. So uh, ABC Sports developed the idea I was chosen out of a talent hunt because I had been doing the uh, coaches shows here at the University of North Carolina on the radio networks for the uh, football games. That was a guy named Bill Dooley and the basketball games. That was Dean Smith. And, uh, and through, a, uh, through a sort of step-by-step -step process, I became the person who was hired to work on the sidelines of college football and that began my broadcasting career in 1974. That's amazing. So, so out of college, your first broadcasting job is with ABC. Is, is that correct? Well, yeah. I mean, that's look, you know, it didn't happen, but it did. I, and uh, yes, I went to work for a television network when I was 25 years old and doing something that nobody else had ever done. And yeah, it was, uh, it was mind blowing uh to to tell the truth and i you know i uh i had too much fun i uh, uh i thought of myself as an instant star uh that was that was an overshoot i i wasn't an instant star i was just an amazingly lucky guy with a uh, great entry level gig and then i realized how to go forward and and uh, at that time abc sports still had abc's wide world of sports and Wide World of Sports had all of these funky, underexposed events like the wrist wrestling and the log rolling and the barrel jumping and the uh, Oriental World of Self-Defense and the Demolition Derby on Long Island. There were all these events and there were, you know, there were veteran announcers on the staff, Chris Schenkel, Bill Fleming, 
uh, Jim McKay, obviously the host of Wide World of Sports, Cosell, uh, Gifford, all those people were veterans. And, and so um, every one of those people had done the wrist wrestling and the log rolling and the barrel jumping once or twice. Uh, and as my upward path, paying my dues to move forward at ABC, I became the first guy to do all those events multiple times. Okay. I, I did the wrist wrestling five or six times. I did the uh, demolition derby five or six times. And, and, you know, it was all about paying my dues. When I went to the Olympics, I was a, uh, a feature reporter. I, I was, you know, hidden in the background, in the masses, et cetera, et cetera. But all those um, assignments were my way of finding my way up the ladder and getting more and more exposure and, um, you know, moving toward larger exposures like succeeding Cosell on the halftime highlights of Monday Night Football. Never should have done that. Uh, or um, eventually becoming late night host at the Olympics, uh, daytime host at the Olympics, and studio host of Wide World of Sports. And, you know, it was like jumping from um, lily pad to lily pad to lily pad across a pond. And sometimes you'd jump onto a lily pad and put junk, you'd go into the water and, uh, and get drowned. But uh, other times, if you managed to stand on the lily pod, you were doing a good job, you were getting exposure, uh, you were constantly going forward. And, uh, and like I said, eventually we got to 1987, network was sold, new manager came in, he wanted to get rid of me, couldn't stand that I had a huge contract. I had great guarantees coming up for the uh, Calgary Winter Olympics in 1988. And his judgment without knowing a single thing about me, he said, you know what, boxing will hate him and he'll hate boxing. So I'll assign him to boxing. Now, what, what that guy didn't know at the moment that he made that decision was that the business staff at the network had signed a contract, a sort of look-see development, developmental contract with a 19-year-old heavyweight from upstate New York, whose name was Mike Tyson. Mm -hmm. So my first boxing telecast at ABC Sports was Mike Tyson's first network television exposure. That's uh, great. Uh, and... Uh, <laughs> and uh, against a North Carolina fighter named Jesse Ferguson. And I was calling the fight with a brand new expert commentator named Alex Wallow, who was an executive at the network. He'd never been on the air before. So neither of us had ever actually called a fight live and we're calling uh, Tyson versus Ferguson. And uh, in the fourth round, Mike threw an uppercut that flattened Jesse's nose and there was blood all over the ring when the referee uh, stopped the fight a couple of minutes later. And uh, then Alex, my expert commentator, jumped into the ring to go interview Mike. And the first question was about the uppercut. And Mike said, well, Cat Tamato taught me that the purpose of the uppercut is to drive the opponent's nose bone into his brain. So I was trying to drive his nose bone into his brain. And I would say there was I think, oh, my God. This guy isn't just going to be the biggest quote machine in boxing. He's going to be the number one quote machine in sports. Look at what I have happened into here. Uh, and sure enough, it, it was it, it only took a period of six or seven months between me calling that first Tyson fight on ABC and getting the contract to replace Barry Tompkins calling fights on uh, HBO. Wow. That that. That, that's that's an amazing story. And, and, and what, that's a gift from heaven, you know? Yeah, for you know, sure. That's even more bizarre than the college football thing, to uh, a certain degree. I, I, I actually would agree with that. I actually would agree with that. Before we get into the HBO, uh, I want to talk about... So you hold the American record for broadcaster. You went to 14 Olympics? Is, that, is Did I get that seven, number right? Seven winter and seven summer. And, uh, and that began at ABC with the Winter Olympics of Innsbruck in 1976. And that ended in Beijing in 2008 uh, with NBC. But yes, uh, I was a broadcaster at 14 Olympic Games. And the last several, the last um, eight, I think I was uh, a host. No, more than that. I think the last nine or 10, I was uh, a 
daytime host or a late night host. I was never the primetime host, but I was always uh, in the studio uh, with an important role for um, all of the last several Olympics that I broadcast. So yes, it was um, a great gift to my career. What, what, what would you say is your favorite Olympic memory? My favorite Olympic memory? Well, that's absolutely indisputable. Um, my assignment at Lake Placid was mostly politics. Um, the United States uh, Olympic Committee was um, dickering with the possibility of uh, boycotting the Moscow Olympic Games later that mm -hmm. summer. Um, and there were many things going on in Lake Placid, including a meeting of the IOC, IOC Board of Delegates, and, uh, a visit by the Secretary of State of the United States, Cyrus Vance, and uh, other political events relative to the potential boycott. And at the same time, the organization for those games was a disaster and was falling apart. There were thousands of ticket holders waiting in remote parking lots in sub-freezing temperatures for buses that never showed up and uh, that, lots of other terrible organizational things going on. And my job was to cover all of that. So on the second Friday, on the last Friday of those Olympics, um, I was in a tape room with a tape editor and a producer putting together a compendium of all of the stories I had done and the things I had covered in the preceding two weeks. And we were watching on a tiny monitor on the upper left-hand corner of the edit deck uh, as the United States played uh, the Soviet Union in what amounted to a semifinal hockey game. And uh, at the end of the first period, there was a loose puck in the Russian end. And uh, a kid named Mark Johnson, who for two weeks had been the hottest goal scorer in the world, chased that puck and managed to slip it into the net under the glove of Vladislav Tretiak, arguably the greatest goalie uh, who had ever played, and that tied the game at 2-2. And um, moments after that happened, uh, the red phone rang in our edit bay. Now, the red phone was the Rune Arledge phone. In those days, every ABC sports facility, whether it was a truck or an office or an edit bay or whatever, had a red phone. And the red phone didn't ring. It had a light that went on. And if, if the light went on, you knew that the voice at the other end was Rinaldich. He was the only person who was empowered to use the phone. So the red phone starts blinking in our edit bay. And the producer and the uh, editor both turn around and look at me with this look on their faces that say, we're not going to answer that phone. Uh, you're the senior person here. You have to answer it. So I pick up the phone, hello. Rune says, is Jim Lampley there? I said, yes, this is Jim. How are you, Rune? Uh, he said, I'm fine. He said, look, I don't know if you have any idea of what's going on uh, a couple hundred yards from you, but the United States just tied the hockey game. I said, yeah, we were watching, we, we saw the goal. He said, well, I just have it in my head that something strange might be happening. So I want you to get out of what you're doing there I want you to walk over to the hockey arena and I want you to get in because if we have uh, a 15 minute block left at the end of our time format after the hockey game ends tonight, and if something unusual happens, your job is to get us the best interview you can get to uh, close out the telecast tonight. And the last thing I said to him was room. I don't have a credential to get into the hockey arena. Uh, and he um, said, you'll get in and hung up the phone. And the producer and the uh, editor asked me, they said, what was his answer when you told him you didn't have the credential? I said, he told me I was going to get in. And they were laughing uh, because getting into an Olympic event without the right credential three Olympics after the Munich massacre was impossible. That was not something that you would be able to do. So I walked over to the Lake Placid High School Arena and I um, walked up to the uh, front entrance and the first person I ran into was the high school hockey coach who was the 
arena venue manager, and I had met him a few days ago, purely by accident. And I told him my situation, and he let me in. And I wound up going to a camera platform, and I watched the rest of the game. And, uh, and I went down to uh, the area next to the, uh, the dressing room where I watched almost all of the players on the hockey team exit, walk in the direction away from me amid a melee of cameramen and reporters, et cetera, et cetera. And none of them heard me screaming at them. And I, you know, and I knew the names, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm yelling at all of them as they're walking away and, you know, they don't hear me. And the last player out was Michael Ruzioni. And we had the same agent and he recognized my voice. And so Ruzioni came back to me and said, hey, Lamp, what you doing, et cetera, et cetera. I said, I'm here for you. I said, I, uh, at, at the end of the, the show tonight, we have um, enough time for a closing interview and I need you. He said, oh, I can't do that. I'm going to dinner with Jimmy Craig and his dad. And I said, I said, Mike, you don't have to pay for dinner. All right. <laughs> I'm going with you. I'm not I'm not letting you out of my sight for the rest of the night. So I went to dinner with Ruzioni and Craig. And uh, eventually at um, I guess it was 1053, we were standing uh, outside of that restaurant on the main street of Lake Placid, a giant crowd assembled behind us. Mike's a clever guy. He's very funny. Um, and as we were standing there waiting for McKay to throw to me for the interview, Eruzioni turned to me and he said, Lamp, if we had stood here last night and I looked at behind us at all those people and, and I realized what he was saying and I said, yeah, nobody would have noticed, right? He said, exactly. They wouldn't have had a clue. You know? <laughs> and uh, and uh, so we did the interview, which was unforgettable. And years later, uh, I had several occasions to run into Mike and Jimmy both at um, Olympic memory events and Olympic reunions and stuff like that. And every time Mike would, um, would uh, stand next to me, I'd lean over, lean over to him and whisper. I'd say, Mike, through the miracle of videotape, you are now the leading goal scorer in the history of hockey. And every time. Every time Mike would say, Lamp keeps going in, doesn't it? And yes, it does keep going in. And it's still a miracle. That is aptly named the Miracle on Ice because that was something that could not conceivably have happened, but it did. Wow. That, that's an amazing story. Amazing story. So uh, that's that, my favorite Olympic memory. No. It could not be. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Um, so you had a, a, a long career at HBO, uh, 30 years, right? Yes. Yeah. So I, I, it's hard for me to get into all the fights that I would want to ask you about. Cause you covered many memorable fights, but there's a couple of specific fights. I want you to talk about, uh, historic fights that you covered. First, I want to, uh, I want to talk about, uh, Julio Cesar Chavez versus Meldrick Taylor one. Uh, yes. Very controversial stoppage. Uh, it's funny. We're coming off a controversial stoppage this past Saturday, but we won't get into that. Uh, I, I w w talk to me about that fight, how covering it, uh, how it felt, how it went. What did you think of the stoppage at the time, and how do you feel about it now? Well, uh, I think it's the most controversial stoppage I ever saw, and, and I've heard some people say it's the most controversial stoppage uh, in the history of the sport. Um I think that Richard was, by and large, a good referee. Uh, I don't think that was a logical stoppage. Uh, you know, he, he, he could not have been unaware that there were fewer than 10 seconds to go. Uh, he was looking directly into the corner uh, where the red light was on. Um, Meldrick was standing up and yeah he was taking punishment but he was standing up and uh, you know i think at that moment uh as a referee you have to be aware enough and thoughtful enough that you're looking at an unbeaten olympic gold medalist fighter who has just fought the fight of his life um to clearly beat the great julio cesar chavez uh and 
that it's sort of incumbent on you uh, to give him every possible opportunity to finish the fight, because if he finished the fight, finishes the fight, you're going to be holding up his hand uh, in, in a few minutes. So I was shocked. Uh, I was completely shocked when, when uh, the stoppage took place. And, and I, uh, you know, uh, Richard had an argument, uh, and the argument was about mercy, about, you know, don't let him take another potentially damaging punch. Uh, but he had taken a lot of damaging punches. And, um, and I, I understand that point of view. The only thing I'll say with regard to supporting my own point of view with regard to that is that for better or for worse, and whether justifiably or not, Richard Steele was never again introduced in Las Vegas without getting a thunderous chorus of booze. <laughs> the audience did not forget. And um, with the sole exception of the Chavez maniacs, uh, of whom, of course, there were many, uh, everyone else came to the conclusion in their own minds that Taylor deserved the victory too much to have it taken away from him that way. Okay. Uh, uh, how about Mike Tyson versus Buster Douglas? That's the biggest upset, I and I want to say, in sports history. I, I'm not quite as well-versed as you as uh, all the sports, but uh, that was a very, very big upset. You it, over Well, it's in, right up in, there with the miracle on ice. Exactly. Okay. And just, you covered both events. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, well, obviously, Al Michaels called the game, uh, the hockey game, but I, you know, I was sent there to do the uh, the interview. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes, I covered both events. I uh, and 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 recognize and remember the very first live prize fight I ever went to was Cassius Clay versus Sonny Lister in Miami Beach, February 25, 1964. And that fight was called at that time the biggest upset in boxing history. So um, as I was sitting in Tokyo looking at what was now a foregone conclusion in the eighth, ninth, and tenth rounds of Tyson Douglas, uh, I was uh, gripped with this uncanny realization, oh my God, the first fight you ever went to with lawn mowing and car washing money was the biggest upset in the history of boxing. And now you're calling the fight that will succeed it as the biggest upset in the history of boxing. At a moment like that, you, you can't you can't avoid thinking that this is meant to be, you know, I, I was supposed to be here. Um, and um, I think, you know, obviously I was like everybody else. I thought there was no chance that Buster could win the fight. And I thought that this was going to be a bloodletting and that, you know, Mike would tear him up. But if you look back, if you look back, you know, critically at all of the circumstances, what was going on in Mike's personal life, um, and the the fact that uh, his trainers were now inexperienced people without a deep and uh, thoughtful background uh, as trainers, and that his life was chaotic and uh, a lot of uh, troublesome things were were going on. If you looked at all of that, and then you looked at how he had performed in the last six or eight fights leading up to that against bigger, taller, right-handed fighters who could bring the right hand over the top, et cetera. He, he went the distance with James Quick Tillis. He went the distance with Mitch Blood Green. He went to the last 10 seconds with Jose Ribalta. He went the distance with Tony Tucker. He never really threatened or hurt Tucker a single time. There was a lot of evidence leading into the fight that you could have set, looked at and said, well, he's not going to dominate Douglas. He didn't, he didn't do anything special against these other guys. And Douglas maybe is the best of them. You know, he, he might be the worst of them, but he might be the best. Um, you just don't know. And then early on, from, from the first round on, it was obvious Douglas could land his jab. He brought the right hand directly over the top, uh, which made it very difficult for Mike to see it from, from his height and his crouch, et cetera, et cetera. And Douglas wasn't just winning the rounds. He was dominating. Uh, and, uh, and, and Mike was taking more and more punishment. So by the, time, by the time the knockout takes place, that's not really a shock knockout. Now, in seeing in a vacuum, Buster Douglas knocked out Mike Tyson. Yeah, that's a shock. 
if you had gone out that night and hadn't stayed home to watch the fight in the United States and you learned it from broadcast news or in the newspaper, yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, a, an absolutely, you know, uh, mind-blowing shock. But if you saw everything that I saw and you sized it all up within the context of all those factors, no, it, it wasn't a shock. It was coin of the realm. Um, and uh, of course, you know, uh, it ruined Douglas's life because he was not ready for that kind of a win and not, not ready for the acclaim and the celebration that went with it. But it wasn't a hard fight for Buster to win. And, and he won it, obviously, very clearly and decisively. What did you make of uh, uh, Mike Tyson's, uh, I don't want to say excuse, but claim that uh, when he dropped a Buster Douglas, that Buster Douglas got a long count? What, what, what do you make of that? I didn't think it was a long count. Replay didn't suggest that it was a long count. Uh, the only reason there was a long count controversy was because Don King was uh, Mike's promoter and Don was going to do anything and everything he could to wrangle uh, boxing authorities and use his uh, political clout and his uh, uh, boisterous style and his threats to, uh, to try to win the argument. But no, I never thought for a second that that was too long a count. Okay. All right. Uh, well, Another fight that uh, was a big upset, not quite as big an upset, but it's still a huge upset. And in my opinion, it's your best call. And that's your former co-worker, George Foreman versus Michael Mora. Uh, you have that <laughs> famous line, it happened, it happened. Uh, so talk to me about the fight. Talk to me about how you felt about George Foreman and 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 and, and that call. You know, it happened. It to me, uh, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. That that's your most famous uh, uh, call. Yes, it's my most famous call, and yes, uh, I think it can be seen as my best call. And uh, and it was not something I conjured. It was not something I planned. Uh, it was utterly and completely spontaneous. In fact. Uh, as, um, as Moore is lying on the canvas and the count is progressing to three, four, my first thought is why the hell didn't I dream something up for this? What, you know, why do I not have, do you believe in miracles in my pocket here, ready to go for, uh, for this kind of, uh, a moment? Why, what, how could I have been so stupid as to not consider uh, the possibility that this would happen. And the pretext, which you may have read somewhere because I've told the story many times, of course, George was my expert commentator. And I was working with George uh, frequently in the months leading up to the fight. And uh, George and I had called Moore versus Holyfield together. And several times, probably a half dozen times, uh, I would pull George aside at ringside and I'd say, George, how are you going to beat Moore? He's a southpaw. He's a mover. Holyfield couldn't find him, couldn't, couldn't handle him in the ring. And Holyfield has much better feet than you have. And over and over, George would look at me and say, Jim, you watch. Somewhere late in the fight, he will come and stand in front of me and let me knock him out. Now, the words are unforgettable and they are precisely accurate because he said it the same way every time. He will stand in front of me and let me knock him out. And if you watch it on videotape and hear that in your head, it's freaky. It's very striking. So how did he get that to happen? Well, if you go back and watch that round, he comes out in that round and throws two or three wide sweeping left hooks I went back and looked at videotape. He didn't throw that punch a single time in the fight prior to that moment. But as the round began, he threw two or three wide sweeping left hooks. And then he did it again about a minute into the round. And if you watch it carefully, I think it becomes clear that the purpose of those left hooks was to stop Moore from moving to his right and get him to stand in a position where George could line up the one, two. So he throws the sweeping left hooks, several of them, and he gets Moorer 
to stand in a position. He's now moved him about a foot or two to Moore's left from where he had been before. And now that one, two is just a straight shot. Okay. And, and he did it twice. He, he, he hits him with the one, two once and Moore is stunned and he's motionless. And George steps forward and does it again. One, two, boom. And now Moore doesn't get up. So remember, sometime late in the fight, he will come and stand in front of me and let me knock him out. George envisioned it. He looked at tape. He studied Moore. He knew Moore's movements well enough. And, and he gulled him into a position of overconfidence. If there's one thing about George, he could take a punch. I mean, he could really take a punch. So he allowed Moore to hit him with a lot of good, clean shots. He gave Moore the impression that he was totally in control of the fight and could do anything he wanted to do. And he waited till the 10th round. And he used those left hooks to position him. And he lined him up with the one-two. And he hit him twice with the same two shots. And that was that. It was genius. It, and, and, you know, a lot of people thought, I thought, for a long time that George was not a scientific boxer, that he was a pure slugger. Uh-uh. He was a boxer. He was a very, very thoughtful, very scientific boxer. I asked him one night, um, you know, what's the importance of the jab? And he would say, which jab? I said, well, what do you mean by which jab? He said, well, there are four. Uh, and he would show me all four of his jabs. There was the, there was the one that was a thunder punch that was like a telephone pole coming out of a window. Uh, there was one that was a flick. There was one that he would purposely throw to the off cheek, not the cheek uh, on the side where, uh, where he was targeting it, stuff like that. Um, and, and it was all about the science of boxing. George was a boxer. Uh, and he outboxed Michael Moore. It, it, what's interesting, you, you mentioned uh, that he let Moore hit him. Uh, that's what Muhammad Ali did to him. And ironically, I don't know if you know this, he wore the same trunks that he did that night when he lost to Muhammad Ali. So the fact you, that you, you mentioned- made the, You made the right connection. That is absolutely right. Everything about the Mura fight is George's revenge for Zaire. Wow. Okay. He is getting back at everything that went wrong in Zaire, including his own mistakes. And, and so he learned- uh george is brilliant he, he is he is sneaky brilliant and he learned from uh, zaire and he studied it for 15 20 years however long it took you know to get him to the point where he had his sights on that that title again you know and and once moore won it that was his opportunity and this guy's going to be so full of himself this guy is going to be so proud of what he's done this guy's going to think that happened because he's great, but now I've got him, and uh, and he got, and and yes, it was what Ali had done to him in Zaire. He had a took him a long time to really respect Ali, uh, and I I don't think that we ever got to the moment where he liked Ali, but he did gain tremendous respect for Ali over the years, and he understood that Ali had outsiked him and that he could learn from that and outsight somebody else. Yeah. But bo boxing is poetic like that sometimes. Uh, uh, how, how happy were you for a coworker? You know, I know he's a fighter and you, you know, when you cover an events, you try to be unbiased, but I'm sure there's some like, Hey, that's my friend. That's a guy we, I, you know, I call fights with how, how much of that was like, man, I'm so happy for my friend. Well, I, there were a lot of things going through my mind, okay? It happened, it happened is directly related to the things that George told me would happen, okay? Ah. I didn't say to the audience, he told me this would happen, da, 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 but that was exactly why I said it happened, it happened because I was replaying George's um, observations about this in my mind, all the things that he told me in the months leading up to the fight, and that's, you know, that was an automatic response, oh my God, it happened. Uh, so, uh, you know, I'm just lucky that, uh, that that played out that way. And then as we're responding to it, reacting to it, I remember saying to myself, don't celebrate, uh, you know, because I, 
I didn't want to be um, too um, one-sided about the fact he's my buddy, he's my broadcast partner, et cetera, et cetera. This is about him, not me. This is about him, not HBO. So don't celebrate for us. Don't celebrate for me. Uh, leave it to George to be the one to celebrate in his way. And of course, his way to celebrate was go throw himself on his knees in the corner and pray. Okay. All right. Uh, so th another fight I want to, I want to, I want you to talk about is Bo Galata in Madison Square Garden where there was a brawl. Uh, that was one of the craziest things I've ever seen happen in boxing. And from what I understand, your daughter was in the crowd as well. So if, if one, you could you tell me, you know, remember? Her? Yes, yeah. I do. Yeah. So at this moment, at the moment of that night, mm -hmm. she's 16. Uh, she, she's 16 years old in, at this fight. She was 16 at, uh, yes, at, at that fight at Bogolai. And um, she was living in London. Uh, but she had come to New York to join me, uh, and we were going from New York to Atlanta for the Atlanta Olympics the following day, the day after uh, Bogolata. <clears throat> and I, uh, I told her about the fight. She said, can I get a ticket? I said, okay. So I had gotten for her a second row ticket right at ringside, directly behind me, as close as she can be to the ring. And uh, on the afternoon of the fight, she called me and said, um, you know, one of my old buddies from school here in New York wants to go tonight. Can I get two tickets? And in getting two tickets um, for her and for her friend, Mike Kopech, that entailed a switch from the second row behind me at ringside to the second deck upstairs in the middle of uh, the arena, far, mm -hmm. far from the ring. Now, you know, Rock Newman was a chip on the shoulder kind of a guy. And he was trying to teach Riddick to have a chip on his shoulder. Riddick was not a chip on the shoulder kind of a guy. Riddick was a, a happy-go-lucky good old boy. But Rock was working really hard to try to get uh, Riddick to have a chip on the shoulder. He, he thought that might be marketable. Um, and of course, Galata was a... Uh, Galata was uh, uh, kind of a street thug from uh, from Poland. He had uh, done some done some physical work on the docks uh, in Poland, and he was not unaccustomed to fights both in and out of the ring. Um, and uh, and so I'm calling the fight at ringside. I had no idea uh, where Brooke was sitting. I hadn't thought about it since the ticket position uh, had changed. And the fight ends, and all of a sudden, there's this guy from Rock Newman and Galata's group who runs across the ring and starts hitting Galata on the head with, um, with in one of those cell phones that was as big as a shoe. It was like a walkie-talkie. Right. And he's hitting him on the head with that thing, and there's blood. And all of a sudden, people are pouring into the ring. George... I was announcing, I'm trying to call the action in terms of the brawl. I'm now describing a brawl. It's a news event. Fortunately, I had been news anchor in Los Angeles. I just switched immediately from my sports broadcasting hat to my news anchoring hat, and I'm describing what's going on, et cetera. George um, puts his arm out behind me like an arm, like an iron bar, and, and now has created a barrier behind me at ringside that prevents all of these people who are jumping and running into the ring from disturbing me. He's like a bodyguard for me. And you can hear him at one point uh, in the background on the audio saying, you don't want to go in there. You, that's not something you want to do. And he talked two young thugs out of going into the ring. Um, and uh, uh, but, but I'm focused on what's going on there. And eventually, um, I realized that we had done our opening on camera from a camera platform up uh, four or five sections back beyond ringside. And you had to climb up the stairs to get up all the way to the camera platform. And I realized that there would still be a microphone there because we had done the opening on camera up there. Mm -hmm. So I turned and left ringside 
and ran back and got up those stairs and got up onto the camera platform and spent the last oh, 10 minutes or so of what was going on calling uh, and describing the, uh, the brawl uh, from up there. And the executive producer, a guy named Ross Greenberg, is in my ear. You know, take this as long as you need to. Uh, I'm in a truck. I can't tell what's going on. You're the one who can see the arena. You have to make a judgment when we're going to uh, get out of all this. But uh, you got to be sure that you cover everything meaningful and just make your own judgment as to when, um, when you're finished. And at some point, I made a motion to the cameraman like, you know, we can close now. And the cameraman told the truck, that's what I was thinking. And Ross Greenberg in my ear said, all right, if you, if you think we're ready, then go ahead and sum up everything that happened, both in the fight uh, and in, in terms of the riot. And then if you have some personal comment to make about it uh, before we get off the air, go ahead and make the personal comment. And when he said personal comment, that's the first time I thought about my daughter. That was the first moment that I had remembered that she was there and um, that no matter how safe I might have thought things were, I didn't know for sure whether she was okay. So my final comment was, and somewhere in here, I've got a 16 year old daughter, uh, I've got to go find her. And I took us off the air and we, you know, closed the show. Following day, Brooke and I got on a plane and flew down to Atlanta. And in Atlanta, our NBC hotel was um, on a metro, on a, uh, a train line, about four stops up from where the broadcast center was. So every day, Brooke and I would get on the train to go down to the broadcast center and then come back in the afternoon. And every time we rode the train, every time, somebody would come up and say, is this her? Is this your daughter? Is this the one who was in Madison? Are you okay? Da, 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 et cetera. <laughs> She became a little bit of a celebrity there uh, because of uh, all that. And, uh, uh, you know, that that didn't happen because of, of Riddick. That, that happened because of Rock Newman and the kind of people he liked to have around Riddick and the people that he had recruited into their camp. Riddick was not the kind of person who ever would have condoned or wanted that kind of thing. He was gentle. He was sweet. Okay. okay. Uh, the the last fight uh, I I want to ask you about, uh, and then we'll move on to to a couple. Well, not the last fight, but the last fight I want you to get in depth. I guess is uh, Mayweather Pacquiao. It's uh, it's probably the biggest fight last you know twenty, thirty, forty years. Uh, Monetarily, it's the biggest event in the history of boxing. You yeah, know, in terms of money, it's the biggest event ever. For sure, for because, sure. That's because of social media. Yeah, and that, that's because of all the people who spent enormous sums of money uh, for the outcome of being able to stand in that arena and hold up a ticket and take a selfie and say, look at me, look at where I was, look, look at what I got. I, I got actually into the fight for months, for months, people would come up to me on the streets or at other fights, et cetera, et cetera, and say, oh, I'm so excited about Pacquiao and Mayweather. And I would say, Why? What, what is it that you're excited about? Oh, it's going to be such a great fight. And I would say, do you really think that? I mean, what, what in the world would prompt you to think that it's going to be a great fight? Well, they're such great fighters. Yes, but look at the styles. Do you, do you not understand what it is that Floyd Mayweather does? Uh, you know, the only, the only way Floyd Mayweather is ever going to be in a great fight is if all of his skills are eroded and he's been beaten down to nothing. Right now, he's still pretty close to in his prime. So the notion that you'll ever see him in a great fight, that's crazy. That's totally antithetical to his style. <laughs> great fights are not what Floyd does, okay? And it's it's a mark of his brilliance as a marketer that he, he's got you believing that there's going to be something interesting to see there. So you saw the fight. You know, I mean, <laughs> it, it was a nothing happened fight. And, um, and I knew that that would always be the case. Um, a lot of people, and, and I'm of this camp as well, so I'm not going to be vague with it. I, I, I thought the fight happened three, four years, five years too late. Uh, not, you know, not too late, but more like it should have happened a little bit before. Do you think the outcome 
would have been different had the fight happened in 2009, 2010? No. Um, I, I think you're 100% correct that it should have taken place long before it did. That was Mayweather both A, building the event up, playing social media, uh, stretching it out as long as possible uh, to, to get the maximum uh, uh, market clout and also at the same time allowing Manny to deteriorate and, uh, and get weaker and weaker and weaker. The great counterpuncher always has an advantage over the great attacker. There's never a moment in the history of boxing when the great counterpuncher doesn't have an advantage over the great attacker. That's point one. Uh, point two, Mayweather was brilliant, an amazing defender. Um, Manny was definitely on the downside and not nearly as good uh, at that point as he had been long before. But he sure as hell needed the money uh, and, and wanted the money. So Floyd had him in exactly uh, the right position. And uh, everything played out the way I expected it to. Okay. What would you say is the greatest fight you ever worked? Not, you know, seen on television. I'm talking about that you were behind the mic. Well, there are a lot of them. Uh, you know, I the, the first fight between uh, uh, Marco Antonio Barrera and Eric Morales is epic, unbelievable almost indescribable, describably beautiful violence. Uh, first fight between Arturo Gatti and Mickey Ward, same thing, epic, unbelievable, amazing, uh, uh, brilliant uh, violence. Uh, uh, hey, Chavez versus Taylor uh, is a magnificent fight, uh, right. brilliantly fought on uh, both sides. There have been, I couldn't single out uh, any one. Uh, I've had uh, an amazing privilege, particularly all the trilogies that I called uh, Bogle, I mean, excuse me, uh, uh, Bo Holyfield, tremendous trilogy, uh, and um, Barrera Morales and Gaddy Ward, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of great fortune for me. I was calling fights during an era when there were a lot of great fighters, and, uh, and I called probably as many truly great fights as anybody other than Don Dunphy uh, has ever called. Okay. All right. Who would you say is the greatest fighter you ever covered? Hmm. Not of all time that, that, you know, that, that you had the, the, the greatest calling. fighter I ever covered. So with Chavez. Well, okay. Uh, I mean, I, this gets, this gets, um, uh, this gets involved because I am a very strong believer that heavyweight boxing is one sport and weight class boxing is another sport. That's fair. Uh, That's fair. We, we could, we could split them. That's fair. I, I, I think the same too. I, I say there's boxing, then there's heavyweight boxing. That That's a line I use a lot on this page. Yeah. I think you're hundred percent correct about that. So I think um, uh, for skill and sacrifice and brilliance, uh, I would take, Barrera Morales won uh, as the the greatest uh, weight class fight uh, I ever called, and I would take Bo Holyfield won as the greatest heavyweight fight uh, I ever called. And they both went the distance, and uh, and I think that's a almost a pre prerequisite for a truly great fight is that it does go the distance, even though the public likes to see knockouts. Uh, knockouts means. One guy got significantly the better of the other at, at uh, the final moment. And when the fight goes the distance, it's because neither guy got significantly the better. They were both great. Uh, so I'll go with Bo Holyfield and Barrera Morales won. Who would you say is the greatest fighter you ever cut or covered? You know, like whether it be Chavez or Mayweather or Lennox Lewis or Pacquiao, you know, who would you say? All of those. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. But Every single it down one. To one. I, mean, I mean, look. Uh, Roy Jones. Lennox, Lennox on his best nights was beyond awesome. Uh, he was a very, very gifted heavyweight. And, you know, he had everything that uh, you can look for. Um, and so, I, you know, I would call Lennox the, the number one heavyweight uh, that I covered. Although, you know... I didn't cover the early George Foreman. 
Uh, I covered the second George Foreman and what he did with Moore was intellectually uh, amazing, great, almost unsurpassed. Um, it's really hard. It, it's very, very hard to isolate any uh, one person as uh, the, the greatest right. fighter ever. Um, you know, people who love defensive counterpunchers and skill would say, hey, wait a minute, what are you talking about? You covered Floyd Mayweather. And yeah, he was, he was about as good at that as anyone could be. But uh, I lean toward fighters who could um, excite the crowd because of their will toward violence. It's a violent sport. Yeah, I understand. Uh, so, all right, so I, I, who who's your favorite? So this has nothing to do with who's the best. Who's the favorite fighter you ever covered? Like when you when mm. you were sat down and 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 it was like, hey, June twelfth, you're gonna you know we're sending out to Vegas to cover so and so's fight. Who well, I'll favorite? tell you this. Okay, uh, I I will say this because when I first got into the sport, boxing needed someone who could car carry the sport and preserve and improve and uh, elevate its market value, and um, and that required somebody who had glamour, who had style, who had some skill and was willing to fight the best every time he went into the ring. And that was Oscar De La Hoya. Oscar De La Hoya did more for boxing than any other fighter I ever covered because of his willingness to fight the very best fighter he could possibly fight every time he went into the ring. And um, Oscar De La Hoya, I love to say this because I really believe it's true, Oscar De La Hoya sold more tickets to individual women who bought the ticket than any other athlete ever in the United States. There may be a Euro European soccer player who's in that league, but in the United States of America, no athlete I've ever known of sold more tickets to individual women who bought the ticket, not needing a man to take them, not needing a man to buy them the ticket than any other athlete. And that is a a tremendous uh, value to bring to a sport. He, listen, if I was covering these events and I see a fighter bringing all these women, he would be my favorite too. I'll never forget, <laughs> he, fought a, he fought a guy named Patrick Charpentier in El Paso. And the fight was in the football stadium where in the Sun Bowl, where the uh, Texas Tech football team played, um, or Texas El Paso football team played, I should say. And he drew close to 50,000 fans that day. And I remember I went up to the top level of the stadium and looked down at the road where people coming up the road to come into the gate. And there were bunches and bunches, four women, five women, six women, three women, no men in these groups of people coming to the fight themselves to see Oscar. And I remember thinking, what? other American athlete ever had that kind of appeal. And I can tell you it was. It was the first fight I ever saw. It was Sugar Ray Robinson. Sugar Ray Robinson. He had that kind of appeal. And and Oscar duplicated it. Okay. He wasn't as great a fighter as Sugar Ray Robinson for sure. But he duplicated the appeal for women. Okay. Um all right. So it so HBO was the gold standard for a very long time. For about 30 years was if you wanted to see the best, uh, you know, you had to go to HBO. Why did they leave boxing? I, 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 yeah, why? Call at and and ask that question. I don't know. I have no idea. Um, for whatever reason, when uh, a cell phone company from Dallas purchased the greatest entertainment company in the world, Time Warner, uh, maybe the first important major decision they made was that they had no further interest in presenting boxing matches. So that's all I know. AT&T oh. bought uh, HBO and um, and suddenly there were no boxing matches anymore. Okay. Uh, so in the past, you've had some uh, some uh, unsavory words, I'll say, for, for Al Heyman. Uh, what, what do you think he's done to boxing? Well, I don't know that I've said anything really nasty about 
Al Heyman. I, I, you know, um, I think there's something to be said for wanting to protect your fighters. Uh, and I, uh, I know why Al has a personal interest in safety for his fighters and uh, preventing danger to them, et cetera, et cetera. But it, if you, you know, if, if you go about running careers that way in boxing, you're ignoring one of the most important elements of the sport, which is danger, which, you know, which is risk. It's, it's a sport about risk. It's a sport about danger. And all too often, um, what I saw from Al was uh, the avoidance of risk and wins that were managed in advance rather than needing to be earned uh, in the ring. Too many mismatches. Um, but, uh, you know, he's a businessman. He has the right to run his business uh, whatever way he wants to. Um, we never had any nasty words with each other. So, uh, would, you, would you say he's, uh, how do I say, it? like, is he ruining boxing? Well, what's Larry Merchant's great line? Boxing. Uh, can't love it. Can't kill it. Something like that. Uh, I forget exactly what Larry said. I, you know, boxing has been ruined ever since it first began. Uh, and uh, it's been written off over and over and over. And, yeah, I think that Al has had some institutional power and some influence, but it's pretty hard for any one person to ruin boxing. I, I don't think that, I don't think that's within his range or anybody else's range for that matter. Okay. Uh, so would you say you, you like or dislike the, the direction of where boxing is headed? Well, um, I think that the trouble with, the distribution patterns that are now being used for boxing. Um, and hey, you, you could make this criticism of HBO and Showtime back uh, in the day when they became ascendant, but they weren't as expensive uh, per fight uh, or per product as are the distribution systems that are now being used. Um, but most of the current distribution systems shrink the audience rather than expand it. Uh, and, you know, it's about um, getting the most bang for the buck uh, via streaming, via pay-per-view. Um, you do those things over and over and over, and you make that the primary distribution system for the sport. And, you're killing the audience. You're you're shrinking the the long term potential. How you know how do um, working class fathers show their sons the sport over and over on TV and get them to fall in love with it if they can't afford to buy it? And uh, and so I I think that um, there there have been too many uh, business fluctuations toward formulas that maximize the uh, monetary output of a single fight or maximize the monetary output of a single fighter without expanding the envelope of attraction for the entire sport. And, um, you know, obviously nothing's ever going to be as good as pure network television was when, you know, people could tune in Saturday night or Saturday afternoon and see Cassius Clay, see Muhammad Ali. Uh, that was not comparable to, to what goes on now. That was far, far superior. So anything that uh, maximizes the dollar return on individual fights by squeezing the envelope down to a smaller channel, that's not good. I got you. And that's where we are now. I got you. So I'll... You're now a uh, college professor. Correct. Uh, how, how do you like that? It's it's a lot different from your previous career. How, how do you like being a college professor? Well, it's frustrating because I <laughs> uh, don't get enough um, qualitative feedback on how much my students are learning and what they're paying attention to. 
that's my fault. I need to restructure the course and uh, and do it in such a way as to get um, a better return. Uh, but I I love going into a classroom and talking to young people about things that uh, that matter. I uh, the course I teach is called evolution. Everybody expects me to do something about sports. It's not. The course is called Evolution of Storytelling in American Electronic News Media. It draws from my experience as a news anchor and my experiences watching news organizations up close and knowing news television uh, executives. And uh, uh, at the beginning and end of, the, of every semester, I try to get across to the students that we are talking about um, the institutions which affect the delivery of electronic news information to the public. We're talking about how those stories, the, the individual stories and in news are affected by engineering, by business circumstances, by personnel, by the personalities who are delivering the uh, information on the air. There are a variety of factors that uh, are all at play. And at the end of the day, I always write on the blackboard, blackboard comes down to one thing, T-R-U-T-H. This is about truth the threat to truth, the fight to preserve truth, the desolation of a news environment that is not presenting truth uh, and, uh, and how dangerous that is for our society. You know, democracy could disappear in the United States and within the foreseeable future. Public opinion polling shows that one third of the public would prefer a more authoritarian form of government something that's more efficient than than what we've got that's the fault of news media or at least media which call themselves news media but which are not really news media because they're not uh trafficking in truth uh and uh, unless we can preserve truth and integrity in american electronic news media then uh, i don't think we can protect democracy and that's not going to be good for americans or for mankind okay that's why i'm uh, teaching that, that, do your students ever recognize you like, oh, you're like, you know, you're the guy from HBO or, or like my dad, you know, recognizes you or do, do any of your students ever know who you are? Plenty. Yeah. A lot of them. Yeah. Some okay. of them take the course because, you know, their dad tells them, oh, you got to take this course or or they uh, recognize my name. Yeah. And I think some of them are uh, thrilled and some of them are disappointed at what they get. Life goes on. <laughs> exactly. Uh do you ever see yourself uh, coming back to commentating? You know, um, nobody's asked me, to, to be totally honest with you. I mean, I, uh, I have not had a credible or meaningful offer to call fights. Well, one, uh, I, I briefly signed a contract with Twitter and I accepted one payment which I believe was the largest amount of money ever paid to uh, anybody to call a fight in this culture. And, um, and I took that money and the fight was canceled and I have never gotten another offer to call a fight. Uh, that was a tr Triller, right? Triller. Yeah, Triller. yeah, thank you, Triller. Um, Teofimo Lopez versus George Cambosos mm -hmm. uh, was the fight that uh, got canceled. And, uh, and at the end of the day, thank you, Triller. I appreciated the, uh, it was like getting a tip going out the door. Uh, <laughs> but, I, but I haven't gotten uh, any other offers from any of the other organized vendors who are calling fights. And I, you know, your guess is as good as mine as to why that uh, might be the case. I don't know if they think my price is too high uh, or maybe I offended uh, executives or you know, I I kind of suspect that promoters might have something to do with that. But for whatever reason, uh, there doesn't seem to be a particular market for Jim Lampley to call fights. Man, the zone and ESPN, they could sure use you, man, because sometimes I, I got to put it on mute. Sometimes it, it, it's bad out there. We we, we need I, I'm spoiled. I was raised in the Jim Lampley era. Uh, I, yeah, I, I really don't feel like your, your voice has been properly uh, replaced. Well, I like the Jim Lampley era, era but, uh, you know, um, those two labels that you mentioned, I'm sure that they feel like they're 
just as well served or better served with the uh, the men that they have calling fights. Okay. All right. Well, that's all the questions I have. Uh, you've been very gracious with your time, so I understand if you can't, but I want to open up the phone lines for the people to call in and ask you a question. Is that okay with you? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, let's see. What time is it? It is 514 Eastern time. I, I've yeah. got about 16 minutes. Oh, there you go. All right, guys. So he he has 16 minutes. I will be putting the link in the chat. Please keep your questions brief. Understand there are other people that want to ask questions. He's been very gracious with his time. So again, uh, the link is in the chat. Come ask one question. I'm going to drop you after that. And then uh, uh, if oh my somebody... God, there's a fly in my office. This fly is in trouble because I'm a bad dude. Um, all right. <laughs> We'll see. All right. W w while we wait, uh, you you've been in a few mu movies. Uh, uh, talk to me about that experience, about being in. So I, it's interesting that you say that. I'm looking up at the wall to my right. Um, the fighter with Mark Wahlberg and Christian Bale. Um, Blades of Glory. That's the biggest gross grossing movie I have ever been in, and I'm using the word grossing in reference to monetary, but some of the jokes also. Uh, <laughs> Southpaw, uh, Balls of Fury, Grudge Match, Ocean's Eleven, Creed, um, Undisputed. Most of them are boxing movies. If you, uh, if you become a sportscaster and you want to be in movies, cover boxing. Because there are many more boxing movies than there are... <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> excuse me, said in any other sport. <clears throat> and if you said, why are there more boxing movies <clears throat> than any other sport? Think about the size of the space that you cover and the number of characters who are on camera in the ring. Mm -hmm. uh, it's the simplest and most compact sport to cover, and therefore it's the one that generates the most movies. I, I also think uh, boxing... There's something intimate about fighting. There's something I, yeah. I, always, I always call boxing like the a microcosm of life. Like you'll know who a person is inside the the the. the oh yeah, the, well, one, I mean, that's one of the things I've always said about boxing is that it exposes everything about you as a human being, uh, and and you know your brain and your body all on full display, uh, and you, you can't hide anything in a boxing match. No, for sure. For sure. Uh, give me one sec, because people seem to be having uh, trouble with the link. So let me see if I could get this. Fixed. I don't know. How could, how could that possibly happen? <laughs> no, you know what it is? I'm, I, well, with you, I, I, it was, I, I have no idea what was going on. But right now, I'm using a, a, a different computer than I'm usually. Uh, so that, that's the problem they're having. So I'm going to. One sec. Let me do this real quick. Uh, all right, I, I, I'm, I'm going to put it in through my phone. That way, I'm 100% giving you guys the proper link. All right. All right, there you go. I, I, I put a new link. This one should work. So, guys, uh, click the link. Hop in. All right. I already have somebody right away. Whoa, that was quick. All right. Saqib, how are you doing? What's your question for Mr. Lampley? Oh, good evening. Uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity. Uh, just wanted to ask, um, I know you've covered fights um, on location in London when you came to Joshua Klitschko. And could you tell me what the atmosphere felt like for you being in a big British event compared to you know, all the fights you've covered in your broadcasting career. And thank you, you very know, much. You know, um, first of all, the, uh, I've, I've been to many, many fights uh, in England, some of them in Manchester. The first one was in uh, London in Earl's Court when Lennox Lewis bounced Razor Ruddock off the canvas like a basketball and uh, became the uh, force that he ultimately demonstrated himself to be in the heavyweight division. That was an unforgettable night. I believe that was Halloween night, uh, 1992. Um, and then, yes, uh, ultimately we get to uh, Klitschko uh, versus uh, Joshua 
You know, Max Kellerman called it the greatest sports event he had ever seen. Uh, and the reference was, you know, one, it was a tremendous fight. And two, the crowd of nearly 100,000 people, uh, the atmosphere, it was unforgettable. Uh, uh, I remember um, Evander Holyfield and Lennox Lewis were seated together at a table behind me. Uh, they were calling the fight for some other foreign television entity. And uh, just to, to sit down at ringside and turn around and look at them and say to myself, oh my gosh, you've got a better seat than Lennox and Evander. Uh, that <laughs> but, uh, but at the end of the day, uh, it was an unforgettable fight between, uh, at that moment, two great fighters. And I, I, uh, I'm not sure that either fighter was ever completely the same, uh, after that fight. And, uh, and it goes to show you how much damage can be done by a relatively small number of landed punches in a heavyweight fight because they were not constantly trading shots all the way through. Uh, but they were landing big shots uh, when they landed. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was tremendous stuff. I'll never forget it. Uh, I was thrilled to be there and it was everything that I expected the fight to be. All right. Th thank you so much to keep. Thank you. Bye-bye now. Take care. Bye-bye. All, right. All right. I have here, uh, Benji, what's up, my brother? How you doing? How's it going? How's it going, Jim? I'm doing all right, Benji. Greatest sports commentator of my lifetime. Hats off. Uh, I always name you as one of the five. Losing you is one of the five worst things to happen in boxing ever. Um, so my question is, what do you think of boxing today? Do you still watch boxing? Is there a fix for boxing? I um, I am still watching boxing. Uh, I, I you know you can't you can't get this particular passion uh, out of your blood. Um, I'm uh, sad for boxing because, as I said earlier, I think the distribution pattern is is shrinking the audience uh, and and also shrinking the number of of truly great fights that we see. Uh, you know, there's there's not enough of um, a logical pathway and conduit toward the best meeting the best. And that's, you know, that's not brand new. That's been going on for uh, quite some time. But um, if, when HBO and Showtime were in existence, uh, those pedestals made it easier and more logical for the, uh, the best to be brought together against the best. And, uh, to try to make that happen um, when you're trying to thread the needle and and uh, hit the ball out of the park on pay per view or streaming, uh, it's just it's not as logically done. Uh, and maybe maybe those distribution systems will mature in such a way that uh, the vendors and the promoters will find better ways of getting to uh, Nirvana, you know, the heaven of the gods uh with great 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 fights but i don't see enough of them now all right thank you so much benji thank you all good right. question all right i have here uh, uh, uh ariel alvarado how you doing my brother what's going on joel much, hey jim P pleasure to pleasure to uh, get this opportunity to speak with you um an amazing interview by you joel job well done uh the only thank question you. i have is i grew up uh, uh Big time Felix Trinidad fan. So every time he fought, you know, the family got together and it was just a major event. Um, and, and, you know, obviously you called many of his fights. So I'm just interested in, in, uh, in uh, hearing from you, you know, what, what, what the experience was like calling those Felix Trinidad fights all those years. Well, Trinidad was excitement personified um, because, uh, you know, he, he was a classic knockout puncher. Uh, his dad trained him to be uh, that kind of fighter, and um, he uh, he would he would take uh, a logical decision, but he was really there looking to knock you out. And fighters like that, you know, they 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 live on risk. They they're willing to take the risk of standing in and stepping forward to 
uh, create the opportunity to knock people out. He was one of the very best at, uh, at that. Uh, and you know, sometimes it didn't work and, and, uh, and he would get hurt, but, uh, to, to see a guy who looked like he was skinny, uh, and had, uh, power and hand speed like that, it, it was amazing to watch him, uh, transform himself in the ring. And of course, um, several times I went to Puerto Rico for those fights and that was always fun. Uh, to go and be in San Juan and be a part of uh, the wonderful, loving, uh, boisterous boxing crowds there. And I got that with uh, Trinidad. I got that with Miguel. Uh, and, and Miguel was, Miguel became like a brother to me. I, uh, uh, I didn't know Trinidad nearly as well. Um, uh, Miguel got better at speaking English. I spoke just enough Spanish to get you know close with him sometimes, et cetera, et cetera, and uh, and in both of those instances, they were wonderful people with fabulous audiences, and uh, and they fought in uh, great great fights. Um, and uh, I, I I think one of Trinidad's uh, greatest nights was the night that he uh, uh, beat Fernando Vargas in uh, in Las Vegas. And I've had many conversations with Fernando ever since that time and talking about the mistakes he made. Uh, and uh, I remember that before that fight, somebody told me, they asked Oscar De La Hoya, said, Oscar, what, what would you tell um, Vargas, if you could, about what he needs to expect against Felix Trinidad? And Oscar said, Vargas needs to understand that Felix Trinidad will do anything it takes, anything. Uh, within the realm of human conception to win a prize fight. And uh, you may remember what happened in the Vargas fight. And he, and he learned that lesson uh, in a very unfortunate way. Yeah. All right. Thank you so much, Ariel. Thank you, guys. God bless. Bye-bye. All right. I have, I have another caller I have here. I lost you, Joel. Oh, so sorry. There you are. Yeah, yeah, so sorry. I don't know what happened there. I have here a uh, virtuoso here. Virtuoso, what's your question for Mr. Lampley? Hey, hey, how you doing, Joel? Jim, uh, it's a pleasure to talk to you. I just want to say deeply, man, I, I want to thank you for all the hard work you did at HBO Sports. You, Roy, you know, Lennox, Manny, Manny Stewart. I love Manny Stewart. His, his insight into the sport was it's truly invaluable. I want to thank you for making my Saturdays with my family. Really enjoyable, man. Uh, thank you. Uh, one of my questions is... Before you go forward, let me just say one thing. Thank you for mentioning right there the closest male friend I've ever had in my life. And Emmanuel Stewart was way beyond a great trainer and way mm -hmm. beyond a great broadcaster. He was a great, great man. And he was the best friend I ever had. So I'm glad his name made it into this conversation. Thank you. No problem, Jim. Um, I, I just wanted to mention real quick. Uh, is it true that you once like uh, broadcasted live sports for HBO back in the 80s with Wimbledon? Uh, I called Wimbledon tennis championships 12 times for uh, HBO. And um, our contract at Wimbledon um, was for weekday coverage because NBC had the weekends. So uh, NBC would have the, uh, the finals. We had the semifinals. Uh, mm -hmm. We had uh, most of the action leading up to uh, the last couple of rounds. But our uh, weekday coverage from Wimbledon was um, six hours of tennis, uh, no commercials. And sometimes, if you know the weather in Wimbledon, or the weather in London, I should say, sometimes six hours, no tennis, no commercials. Uh, so I, I did some of my greatest television commentary, killing time at Wimbledon when there was no tennis to be seen. <laughs> uh, and I was sitting there with Arthur Ashe, Billie Jean King, Martina Navratilova, John Lloyd, uh, all of our uh, great expert commentators on that telecast. Never forget it. Uh, one of my favorite experiences in broadcasting. Okay, Jim, one more question and then I go. I'm, I don't wanna, I'm, I'm, so, 
I'm sorry, Virtuoso. I got, I got, I got too many people. I'm so sorry. I, I don't mean to do that, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm short on time. I have uh, here. I shouldn't have taken that much time for the answer, but go ahead. All right, all right. he's still on. So I, if you want to, all right, Virtuoso, get guy. What's your second question? Yeah, I just wanted to ask you one quick question about Showtime. Do you see the parallels between them and what HBO happened in the in the twilight of its uh, boxing uh, broadcasting run? Parallels between Showtime and HBO? Well, yes. We were, both, we were both premium pay cable services. And, of course, they, they're still doing it. And and uh, we're not. Is Mauro still calling their fights? Yes, yeah, I believe Mauro he is. But, yeah. but I believe people are just uh, kind of upset with uh, the lack of dates. And people right. are wondering what's happening. So the financial formulas have changed. You get more bang from your buck out of uh, streaming and uh, pay-per-view. Uh, it's harder for a premium pay cable service to compete. HBO had a lot more money than Showtime uh, back when I was there. That's the answer to your question. All right. All right. Thank you All so right. much. For Thanks, Jim. All right. You're welcome. All right. I have here Ari. Oh, so, excuse me. Ooh. So, sorry, Bobo. I have here Ari. Delomio, what's up, my brother? Hey, how's it going? Hey, Jim, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate you. Um, currently, who is your favorite fighter that you have to tune in to, to watch? Like, who do you like to watch? of the current fighters right now? Well, I, you know, the last major, major, major fight that I covered was the second fight between uh, Canelo and uh, Gennady Golovkin. And I, you know, I spent time with both those fighters and got to know them well. So I'm still following Canelo to see uh, what happens to him. I also did uh, Dimitri Bivol's first few exposures at HBO and spent some time getting to know uh, Bivol. Uh, so I'm very much looking forward to uh, another fight between Bivol and Canelo, although I'm pretty sure I already know who wins it. I don't see how it could be much different than uh, the first fight. Um, and uh, and then there are a lot of other fighters in the sport that I uh, still cover. But, uh, you know, the one who's probably most important to me as he goes toward the latter part of his career is Canelo. All right. All right. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you. Thank you. All right. I have two more and then, and then we'll close out. Uh, King Slender, how you doing, sir? How you doing? I, I, I can't hear uh, the other side of the mic, so I'm just going to ask it, and I'll come back to the video to hear it. But okay. uh, how do you think um, Tyson Fury would fare in the 90s and say Tommy Morrison at his best? Who would you pick in that fight? Tyson Fury by a violent early knockout. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I, I, uh, I have had this conversation with boxing experts. It's a fascinating conversation. But within the past two or three years, I have taken to asking Bosking experts who in the history of the sport could have beaten him <clears throat> talking about Fury. Because you have to look at it realistically. Again, heavyweight boxing is its own kind of sport. So the physical dimension is extremely important. And it was Emmanuel Stewart who pointed out to me a long time ago, one night when we were at dinner, and I said, I hear that you're training Tyson Fury. He said, yes, I'm working with Tyson in Detroit. I said, why would you be interested in Fury? To me, he looks like a big clumsy oaf who's not going to amount to anything. Emmanuel took a little pause and he said, Jimbo, he's going to be the heavyweight champion of the world. There's no doubt about it. And he may become an unbeaten and unbeatable heavyweight champion of the world. Right now, he's an unbeaten and unbeatable heavyweight champion of the world. Exactly what Emmanuel said he would be. He is six feet, 10 inches tall. He has arms that are longer than that profile would suggest. He's a natural backup counterpuncher whose most of his first instincts in the ring are to defend, not to attack. But when he attacks, he now brings thunder and gets his full body weight behind it and knocks the living hell out of people. I don't know, you know, if Wilder couldn't beat him, and he couldn't, uh, I don't know who in the world could possibly beat Tyson Fury. And Tommy Morrison would make a mistake. Tommy Morrison would would do something, you know, not dissimilar to what happened against Michael Bent. Tommy Morrison would allow uh, Fury some opportunity that Fury would turn into a violent knockout. I don't have any doubt about that. All right. Thank you so much, King Slender. All right. Last call. Oh, two times in a row. That's crazy. All right, last one here is uh, Bo Bo. Bo Bo, how you doing? 
I'm good, man. I appreciate the overtime, Jim. You're welcome. Um, I, I watched uh, a lot of HBO boxing from, uh, from a young age, from my teenage years. Um, you know, it's definitely a way to connect with the, uh, you know, boxing what? in general is one of the few ways we're able to connect with people, but just really quick anyway, uh, I know you're about to go. Um, do you think that the Mayweather situation could have somehow been amended? Because the way I look at it is like, there was a, a broken relationship between Mayweather and HBO, and oftentimes it played out during the um, during the broadcast. Oftentimes with Larry Merchant, and sometimes in your in your dialogue. So, do you think that there was another way that that situation could have been amended? Because if you had a better relationship with Al Heyman, presumably they never would have left, right? We didn't or, have a better relationship with Al Heyman. We we you know the, the relationship. Um, ultimately became, I think, what it was likely to be all along. Uh, Al was encouraging Floyd to pay attention to the things that Larry said about him, very similar to the way that Don King used to encourage Mike Tyson to uh, leave HBO because of uh, the things that Larry said about him. Larry's an honest broker. He calls it the way he sees it. I wasn't uh, tremendously um, how you say, enthusiastic about Floyd's fighting style on the air. Um, there are a lot of boxing sophisticates who absolutely love the backup counterpuncher. I lean toward the more exciting fighter. Uh, and at the end of the day, uh, they did what they did and they made unbelievable sums of money from it, record sums of money. I can't imagine that Floyd is in any way unhappy about uh, uh, the way things turned out. And I don't think that Al is unhappy about uh, the way things uh, turned out. I know some HBO executives who were unhappy about it, who thought that, you know, there should have been a way that we could persuade them to stay in the fold and continue to fight on HBO. But I just don't think it could have been done. All right. Thank you so much, Bobo. I appreciate it. Thank you. All right. All right. Uh, so be before I let you go, I have one last question. Um, I'm known as the voice of Dominican boxing. That's that's my tag. I interview everybody, but I'm known as the voice of Dominican boxing. Dominican boxing has recently been on the rise, whether it be Elvis Rodriguez, Carlos Adames, Hector Luis Garcia, Michelle Rivera, you know, uh, Edwin De Los Santos. Uh, what do you make of the recent rise of Dominican boxing? Uh, back in, you know, when you were covering, the only one that was really – anyone significant was Joan Guzman, who was a terrific fighter, but didn't quite live up to his potential as much as he could. What he do you make he, he did not seek the best competition. He was unbeaten for a long, long time and never really took a big fight. Uh, I don't know if it didn't take or did, uh, the other fighters didn't want it. I'm not so sure it was the other fighters that didn't want it. Uh, you could but, be right. Yeah, he wasn't a big draw, and he was very, very skilled, and uh, I think it was more that. But but what do you make of the recent rise of Dominican boxing, and do you have a favorite, Elvis Rodriguez or Adames or Hector Luis Garcia or any of these guys? Uh, I like Adames. Uh, he's the one that I've seen. Uh, I think he's very good. Uh, and usually when you're getting a crop, you're getting a, um, a number of fighters who are good, they're stimulating each other. They're, uh, they're um, getting each other to rise to higher and higher levels because there's a competitive environment. I don't know. Is there one gym or one trainer who's, um, who's fueling all of this or are there several of them? Well, well, uh, I, <laughs> if you want to get into why they got so much better, there was a Cuban Olympic coach that is now coaching the uh, Dominican Olympic team. He started off with the Junior Olympics. And recently, as of 2020, he started off with the adult now. So all the crop of guys coming up now, when they were on the junior Olympic team, he was coaching them. And now he's up. He's so. And then now currently in the pros, Bob Santos trains most of them. He trains Carlos Adames, uh, uh, Alberto Pueyo, Hector Luis Garcia, uh, you know, Eric. Well, that's Pat usually the, that's usually the way it goes. You know, mm -hmm. there's some linchpin trainer or gym or something that. Uh, that anchors a culture and the culture grows and, and you start to see a, a number of fighters. You may remember not too long ago, three, four years ago, there were a half dozen or so world championship contenders from Ukraine. Uh, and that was 
entirely because of Lomachenko's dad. Uh, Lomachenko's dad was the uh, Olympic team coach. He's an unbelievably brilliant technical trainer. Uh, he teaches craft at a level that very few people in the history of the sport have ever been able to teach it. You've seen that from uh, Vasily Lomachenko, and you've seen that from uh, several other fighters whom he trained on their Olympic team. And that's that's usually what it takes. You know, it's like when uh, when Emmanuel was running Kronk Gym in Detroit, there were a half dozen world champions in that gym. It was yeah. all because of Emmanuel. Uh, you know, tra tra trainers are the, the key to success in the sport. Yeah. Uh, uh, Elvis Rodriguez is trained by Freddie Roach, uh, who, uh, you know, Elvis Rodriguez, a is, southpaw. Who is, who is one of my who is one of my dearest and closest friends and who is a great, great, great trainer. Uh, right. In fact, let's see. Behind me here. Oh, I, I see there. There it yeah. is on Freddie mm -hmm. Roach. That's awesome. A documentary series about him on HBO. All right. Well, Jen, listen, uh, I don't think you've ever had this in-depth interview on video, and I'm glad it's on my platform. I thoroughly, thoroughly enjoyed it. I'm thoroughly, thoroughly grateful that you gave me this opportunity. Well, you're right. I've never done a two-hour and ten-minute interview before. Uh, <laughs> so, so it's been great. I've been very well, entertained by it all. I, I hope you enjoy yourselves. And – Maybe down the line, it won't be as long since I already got your biographical uh, uh, information. So, Ali Bar, yeah. <laughs> the voice of Dominican boxing. Oh, okay. Oh, can you just say that again? Broadway Joel, Ali the voice Bar, of Dominican The voice of Dominican boxing. Yes. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jim. Hopefully, we could do this again. Hopefully, this won't be the last time. One hopes. I'll talk to you later. All right. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. All right, guys. That was Jim Lampley, uh, for a long time, the voice of HBO. Uh, all, I, all I just want to say, that was one of my best interviews, for sure. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed myself. Hopefully, he enjoyed himself as well. Uh, hope to have him on again. Uh, he, he was a great, great interview. And uh, But yeah, guys, gave you guys a long interview. I'm going to go. But just make sure, at the end of the year, when y'all voting Content Creator of the Year, Make sure y'all remember this interview. All right, guys. Until next time. Peace.